North America's charging infrastructure, as far as I could tell, was off to a bit of a slow start at first, which is understandable considering it's a massive, well, set of countries to install a charging network into, but it's catching up really quickly now, isn't it? How would you characterize the North American charging infrastructure right now? Oh, it's really picked up steam over the last four years, especially since we've came on, come onto the scene. You know, and back we put our first station in in 2018, and now have over 800 stations operational. With that means 33,500 charging stations across the U.S. and Canada, so people can drive coast to coast. Uh, so it's really just fascinating to see uh, all the infrastructure that's being put out. 800 charging stations. That's a pretty speedy growth of a network, considering how long ago was it that we had the first electric Yeah, so America? May, May of 2018 is when we put our first station in. So. From now, from then till now, that's about four stations a week we've been putting online. So unprecedented growth for an open public charging network uh, of our size. So it's been a, it's been very exciting, and uh, and it's been great to see all the vehicles coming out and how people are using the network. Four new charges every week, and is that rate continuing? Oh, we're continuing on. So our build out now, we've we just got new investment. Uh, for Electrify America, so we're we're going on our boost plan, doubling down on our original investment, and trying to hit 1,800 stations by the end of or by 2026, which means 10,000 stations across North America, all to enable uh, zero emission vehicles. So I'm sure you have some sort of data on just how busy your chargers are. Uh, based on what you've seen, do you feel that the public charging network in the U.S. is now keeping up? with the growing uptake of electric vehicles? I mean, certainly when we first started, we were ahead of the curve, but now with all these great vehicles that we're seeing, like here, the, the F F-150 Lightning, and so many other vehicles coming to market, which is really making many of our stations quite busy now, especially really key corridors and highways. So this is something we monitor very closely to watch where we're having queuing events and other things happening, so that we can go out and proactively expand stations where we need to. Um, and also just build around so there's more capacity in that area for, for those stations. So it's something we closely monitor. But one of the great things and one of the things we did early on was really focus on what are the vehicles coming in the future need? And that's why we focused on ultra fast charging because consumers want to charge fast and get on their way. And that's right, right from the beginning before any cars existed, we started putting out this infrastructure because we knew this is what consumers need. And the great thing about ultra fast charging is that it charges cars quickly. And so cars can cycle through. So you're not waiting an hour to get your car charged. You're waiting 15, 20 minutes to charge a car and then you're on your way so the next customer could come online. So that's a really important point, isn't it? Because these chargers are pretty quick. These are 150s, but yeah. I think all of your new sites you're installing are 350 kilowatt chargers. There's only a handful of cars on the road right now that can charge that quickly, like that Ionic behind us. Right. But that's a preemptive move, isn't it? That's in anticipation of the next generation of EVs and what they're going to need. Absolutely. And so a few things that we really invested in, one was liquid cool cables so to go to 350 in that high amperage you have to liquid cool your cables to keep them manageable so that's something we invested on and helped propel that technology forward and started in installing that right away the other thing we invested in was the high voltage architecture going all the way up to a thousand volts so that we can handle the newer vehicles that were coming to market and now we see many more of that high voltage architecture coming to the vehicles today and then also for a lot of cars that are having the 400 uh, volt architecture but want to still wanted to push the higher amperage to get higher power, we made sure all our equipment was capable of 500 amps mm. so that we're able to meet that, that, that requirement. So we put all these different things in place to make sure we were building the stations that really are, handle the cars that we're seeing today, but mm. still have room to grow, right, in terms of vehicle sure. capability and, and capacity. Because otherwise you're just digging them all up and installing newer ones in two years when electric cars get quicker at charging. Absolutely, and when you're planning out this infrastructure, you really have to work, work through what kind of capacity am I going to need for the future, right? Because you don't want to bring in more utility five years later. So you got to really work with the utility company, understand what your load profile, understand what the market's doing and have all that foresight in the planning. So you can work right off the bat to bring the right kind of capacity in terms of electrical power to your site right off, right day one. That way you're ready for the future. You're ready to expand. You're ready for that capacity that's needed. So something I'm conscious of, Rob, is how vast and uh, widely distributed your network of chargers are, which must create a bit of a headache when it comes to maintenance. What does the process for looking after such an enormous network of chargers look like? Yeah, so that was one of the things we took on very early on. And so we did several things, and it, it's really based on experience from a lot of the folks that have been in the industry for a while, right? We're putting these assets in that are essentially unattended, right? There's no, there's no storefront to, to manage these stations. Um, so customers are coming up and using them, and, and when they come up and use them, they have to work. 
Uh, and so one of the things we did is in our site design, obviously we built redundancy, right? So we build a lot of chargers in any one spot. So if, if a handle did break for whatever reason, customers have options. There's, there's more chargers to use, so you're not stranded. Uh, the other thing we did is right from the bat, we, we started working with the equipment manufacturers to understand their design, how, how the chargers work, and what kind of systems and other information do we need from the chargers to, to, to feed into our back end, into our network operations center, so that when we monitor the stations, we can proactively see if there's an issue happening, right? And we can dispatch people where we're needed. We also went through and actually built the testing center in Reston, Virginia. So any piece of equipment we deploy in the network, we have that in our testing center. Along, we, we own and lease dozens of electric vehicles. Every make and model you see on the road today is in our lab so that we could continually test and test and test and test and drive that continuous improvement, right? We can get information we're seeing in the field. We can make corrective actions either with a vehicle manufacturer or a charger manufacturer or a network system, and we could drive those improvements um, throughout the system uh, all over the air. So we can drive software updates uh, to any one of our chargers. And then we have an, uh, a, a 24 seven call center, right? So any issue that a customer has, they can call in and we can reset chargers, reset systems, uh, handle any sort of issues that a customer might have to get them charging. And then we have a whole network operations center, right? That's watching every single transaction, every single issue uh, that's happening. And so we could take all that data again, compile it, figure out what are the common types of errors we're seeing and drive either more education material um, better ways to, to handle our, our HMI screen, whatever it might be, we can drive those sorts of improvements on our network because we, we operate it all, right? Uh, so that's, that's the great part of it. So lastly, the other piece we put in, into play is we have a, 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 a fleet of vehicles with drivers that just roam the entire network. And they visit every station twice a month. And they test every single uh, dispenser to make sure it's operational. If it's not, they make a note of that. And so that gets fed back into our production. So we do everything to monitor the network, to be as proactive as possible, to make sure we can get the high degree of reliability. And that's what really makes us one of the most reliable open networks in, in across North America today. The thing that makes me particularly excited about these chargers is plug and charge functionality, which for people that may not know is the ability to do what Tesla owners get to do at Tesla Superchargers, arrive, park, plug in the car, and charging just happens. The car communicates with the charger, communicates with your bank, and then you get billed after the fact. Which brands are currently available to do plug and charge with Electrify America? Yeah, so with plug and charge, we were one of the first ones, or the first one and only one today that really has the official plug and charge um, standards-based uh, implementation. We've ha we do it with Ford, Porsche, uh, and several other uh, vehicle manufacturers, and little by little, more and more OEMs are looking at that technology to implement. And, and the reason is just that, it makes it super easy. Once the customer sets up their account, they need to, never need to think about taking out a phone or a credit card, and they can just plug in and go. But we made sure we wanted to service everyone, right? And make sure everyone had access to the station. So you don't have to join the Electrify America club. You don't have to join an OEM club. You don't have to join any club. You can just go up and swipe your credit card and pay for a charge just like you would feel today. So we, we're, we want to build the most open network that anyone can use so that everyone can drive electric. And that's one of the nice things I noticed, having the contactless payment on every machine so that you don't even have to take your phone out and do the app if you don't want to, if you want to do it the old fashioned way. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And, that, and equity is the big, a big part of what we do. We want to make sure that Electric future isn't just for some, it's for everyone. And having ultra fast charging, whether you live in a home, a multifamily, you have a credit card, whatever, you're able to, to get your charge and live the electric lifestyle. Absolutely. So plug in charge for me feels like the future. The idea that you could just pull up at any charger, plug in, it just happens. That's what we all want. We don't right. want a wallet full of membership cards. It must be quite an intricate ballet arranging this with all the different car manufacturers, some of whom have got different vested interests in different charging companies. How do we go about achieving a future where everyone in any type of car can arrive and plug and charge? Yeah, I mean, the first step is it's got to be a, some sort of standards-based uh, methodology. And, that, and so uh, the ISO 15118 establishes that standard by which plug and charge could happen. And it's really, really built around security, right? Making sure that the, the, you know who the, who the car is, you know who the charger is, and there's a trusted authority by which you know, holds the contract with the customer by which way they're gonna get billed. And so that sort of three-legged stool, you need to make sure that's all in balance and those things check out so that the, the transaction can happen in a safe and secure manner. 
And so that's really what we've brought to market. And so each one of these implementations, obviously we have to work closely with each OEM because it has worked uh, for them to implement uh, systems on, on their vehicle to make happen. Uh, but more and more adoption of this kind of technology that, that comes across, then you'll see you know, wider spread use overall. Um, and, and with Electrify America being everywhere and anywhere basically North America, you know, with plug and charge uh, coupled with your vehicle, there's no reason to charge anywhere else. We've got you covered. Uh, and then site layout is very important, right? So it's a balancing act overall when you look at any site, mm. trying to drive all these different uh, factors into play, plus where's the power? And trying to keep the, the installation cost as, as, you know, uh, as reasonable as possible and still meet all these needs. So, but we've really trained a, a, a pretty sophisticated uh, staff that knows how to sort through all these issues as well as other uh, disability type of requirements to make sure there's space so that everyone uh, is able to charge and work through all these different issues um, to build out uh, stations that work for everyone. And that's actually a really key consideration, which I feel is not a consideration at a fair few charging sites that I've used, accessibility. Because charging is quite a cumbersome thing if, for example, you're a wheelchair user. But I notice sort of, uh, right. we've got ample space, don't Absolutely. we, either side of the car, just to make absolutely sure that... Absolutely, yeah. Equity is always, like I said, equity is a very important part uh, of, of us as a business to make sure we can, we, we, we can get everybody into electric mm. lifestyle. So on the subject of power, on this particular charging site, we've got a big old on-site battery storage system. This is something that you do at a fair few of your locations. What's the thinking behind that? Yeah, so uh, we have an energy storage device um, here, located here at this, at this site. We have them about, about 140, and we're continuing to build out uh, 140 sites, and, and we'll continue to build out. And really, what the primary motivator is, is to help keep the cost of, of power down. Right, so uh, you get charged based on two components, the sort of the, the overall power draw and then the amount of energy you, you uh, take from the utility. So to kind of keep that power draw to minimum in terms of what the utility sees, that's where the batteries really come into play. So it looks like we're drawing, when everyone's charging, the batteries kick in and it looks like we're drawing less from the utility. And that, that helps two ways. One is it obviously helps keep our costs down, but then two, it helps take the stress off the grid. And that's very important, right? Especially here in California where you know, we're switching to more and more renewables. And so, you know, especially in the later hours, you know, from 6 to 9 p.m., it's becoming now the, the new peak. Mm. And so the sun goes down, you got to bring on a lot of other assets to be able to meet the demand. But what the energy stories allows us to do is still be able to deliver the level of service the customer expects during those hours without impacting the grid. And so that's really some, a lot of the technology we've put into play is making sure that we can guarantee a certain service to the customer while managing all the impacts and everything else in terms of cost and, gr and grid stability on the other side. Um, and so we're continually to develop this technology, deploy it more and more, and many of our sites now are coming with even bigger and bigger battery packs. Because what we're, what we're starting to see in some locations, especially remote areas, the utility can't get the amount of power we need to the site. So another thing we're, we're doing is what we call non-wires alternative. So we're bringing in large battery packs that will act as the buffer, basically. Mm. And so they can store quite a bit of energy. We can put quite a bit of output in, D, in terms of DC charging so customers can get the experience. And, and we'll just draw the power from the batteries. And then in the late overnight hours, when there's time, we'll suck up whatever yeah. the utility is able to give to fill the batteries up. And we're also putting solar canopies over many, many of our stations. So we'll actually absorb a lot of the sunlight and store that into the batteries as well. It's again, it's kind of a nice little bit of future proofing, isn't it? Because as Absolutely. the number of chargers in the public charging network grows, the demand on the grid is only going to get higher and higher. So we need to kind of manage out and even out that demand as much as we can, don't we? Absolutely. And this is just part of the planning process. You know, we're always looking five to 10 years out, right? What does that future look like? And what are the things and technologies we need to build out now to be able to meet that need? And we're investing dollars today. And when you come to a site, it's a large investment to mobilize and have to put in this infrastructure. So when we come out, we try to do it right the first time so that we're ready for the future. Can you tell me about your showcase stations? What's one of them? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, typically most of our stations are co-located in some retail environment in the parking area. Uh, and so, you know, the experience is good, but we, we really want to elevate that to the next level. And so we're really looking at how do we build showcase sites? One, to provide a more premium and, and pleasant experience for our customers, but really showcase 
you know, how different driving EV is from regular gas-powered cars and make that experience even, even better. And so we're building a lot of our stations that are large format, uh, taking over whole buildings. We're doing one in, in San Francisco, uh, right in downtown, where it's an indoor experience with 20 stalls, has a customer lounge, uh, and other sort of showcase sites where vehicle manufacturers can show off their vehicles and really kind of taking this to the next level to bring a, a different sort of ambience to, to, to the whole charging experience. Uh, so we're doing this across the country as well as Canada and we'll build out more and more of those stations. That's, I love that idea because we always talk about how you don't want to be sat in your car while charging. You want to go and do other stuff like you do when you're shopping, for example. Absolutely. But the idea of a site that's so cool yep. that you sort of do want to sit there yep. and hang out while your car is charging. And they're charging. iconic and people will notice them and will say, hey, what's that, right? And inquire within and it gets people kind of drawn into the electric experience, right? And then they'll, next time they think about going into the next car, they'll think about an electric car. And, it, and it's great where you can just go sit down, grab a coffee, relax for the 10 to 20 minutes and get on your way. And more to the point, a 20 bay site, again, this is future thinking. You know, Absolutely. if you build a, a site for only you know, a handful of EVs, it's gonna become quite busy quite quickly given the, the rate of uptake. So nice little bit of future thinking. Um, and then outside of charging, I believe that Electrify America has got a few cool projects going on as well. What exactly is Solar Glow One? Solar Glow One is a, a virtual power plant agreement that we signed into uh, to really build a new solar plant in the Mojave Desert. Uh, and, and really when we look at it, right, we're, we're pulling electrons um, and we really don't get a control necessarily where those electrons come from to feed any of the vehicles. And so one of the things we wanted to do is figure out a way where we can really try to uh, drive everything to a re renewable technology. And so, you know, many, many uh, companies and others buy renewable energy credits uh, that are on the market today, but really we felt we needed to go above and beyond and really add to the grid in terms of renewable power. And so what this uh, virtual power um, purchase agreement uh, does is because of our funding and our contract, uh, it allows a developer to actually um, build a whole solar farm, which we're calling Electrify's Solar Glow One. Uh, and that's just sort of the start, right? So now we're 100% renewable in terms of all the electrons that we push through this offset. And so this is just the beginning, right? Our, con our growth is going to continue to happen. The utilizations continue to happen. So we're looking at additional projects to keep this expansion, but really trying to push it to the next level in terms of really transitioning the entire electrical se sector to renewables. Mm -hmm.